so Cambridge University was a, a, always a fun place to do this kind of thing. It's been involved in computing since the very earliest days. And we would argue that with the EDSAC and EDSAC2 computers, we arguably had the first useful general purpose computers here. There are other people in the world who claim they have the first real computers, but we can put in a fairly good claim for that. And one of the things I loved when I started studying computer science here um, in the late 80s was that some of the people who had been the really core pioneers right at the beginning um, were, were still walking the corridors, were still giving lectures. I became friends with David Wheeler, who um, is widely thought to have had the first PhD in computing and in, invented the subroutine. Now the subroutine, if you're familiar with computing, it's about as fundamental a thing as you can get. Um, it was like studying physics and discovering that the, the chap you were sit next, sat next to in the computer room was you know, Isaac Newton. It's, it's, it was really quite fun that these, these really core people who were there at the beginning of the ARM processor, who were there at the, the, the start of many of the programming languages we now take for granted, um, you know, they were all around you. And so I think that um, when we did the, the webcam and, and some of these early, other early projects, it wasn't so much that we were inspired by particular individuals, but because we were in an environment where it was kind of expected that, of course, this sort of thing would happen. Yeah, so after I finished my undergraduate degree, I worked for my college here at Cambridge for a little while, and then I moved into the computer lab where I was a research assistant in the systems group. There were probably about 12, 15 of us in this group. And we um, mostly worked in one room in the old computer lab called the Trojan Room. Uh, but not all of us were in there. There were some who were around the corner, there were some who were up a couple of flights of stairs and, uh, and so on. So it was, uh, it was concentrated in the Trojan Room, but people were spread about a bit. And we all shared this one coffee pot, uh, just a standard drip filter machine. It was very uninspiring uh, machine, very uninspiring coffee. Um, really pretty terrible coffee actually most of the time. But it was just about bearable if you got it when it was really fresh. And I sat right next to this machine, so I was, I was lucky. I, I, I always had fresh coffee, but some of the other people in the group would come down from two or three floors away and they would find that there was just you know, the dregs in the bottom and it was, it was pretty bad then. So either they, they had really bad coffee or they had to go through the process of, of topping it up. So we thought technology can help with this problem. You know, the fair distribution of caffeine was really important to, to, to keep computer science research going. So because we had the technologies that we'd developed for some of this really cutting edge research and some of these bits of kit just lying around in the lab, we were able to, to say, oh, well, let's, um, let's take that camera and, and point it at the coffee pot. Uh, and a friend and I did this one afternoon, Paul Jardetsky and I. Uh, we gripped the camera in a kind of retort stand thing, pointed it at the coffee pot, and we had one of our special computers uh, on which we wrote some software that would capture the image um, a few times a minute. And I wrote a little uh, client program which would display as a little icon in the corner of your screen um, an image of the coffee pot. You, that's all you would see. It was only a black and white image and it didn't update very fast. Um, but it meant that wherever you were in the group, um, in the same room or two or three flights of stairs away, you could just glance in the corner of your screen and see what's the state of the coffee pot. Very simple, very silly, but actually one of the more useful things I did while working in that group. And um, this was before the web. Actually, it was, well, the web was just starting at the time, but, but in the early days, this was in 91, late 91, the web basically was about pages of text. You could change the background colors, you could change the font sizes, I think you could change the text color, you could do bold and italic, something like that. That was about the limit. And, um, and there weren't any images. And it, was, it wasn't until a couple of years later that the first web browser started to get the image tag to support the image tag in HTML, which meant that you could put an image in the page um, as, well as, uh, as well as just have text on the screen. And so most people use this to include pictures of their girlfriends in their own pages or the logo of their institution at the top of the page or something like that. Um, and we wondered what would happen if when the browser connected to the web server and asked for a particular image, suppose the web server didn't give back the same one every time. 
usually it would be giving you a static image that was stored on the disk, but suppose it gave you a different one. How would the browser cope with this? Would the browser notice and refresh it and so on? And how would this work? So um, we, uh, we thought, where have we got a source of constantly changing images we could try this with? Aha, there's the coffee pot camera. So my other friends, Dan Gordon and Martin Johnson, modified our original software so that it could produce HTTP, which meant the web browser could access this image directly. Uh, and that meant um, that you could use a web browser to view the image of the coffee pot. And it meant that the other people in the lab didn't need to be running our special software and our special networking protocols and all of this stuff to be able to see it. And, um, and as a side effect, it meant that everybody in the world could also see you know, how much coffee was in our coffee machine. And there weren't that many exciting things on the web at the moment. And so this qualified as something kind of wacky. Um, and and uh, you know, a, a, a camera that you could connect to a computer was a fairly rare and expensive thing at the time. And so the idea that some crazy people in Cambridge were doing that um, just to, uh, to point it at a coffee pot, you know, uh, especially a not very inspiring coffee pot, you know, I think caught people's imagination. This is the first webcam. This was the camera that we originally pointed at the coffee pot. We went through a few over the years. We went through quite a lot of coffee pots over the years as well. Uh, they didn't get very well treated and they didn't last very long. But, uh, but this was it. This was the thing that um, in the, in, I think it was about October, November 1991, we pointed at the coffee pot. And this is a video camera. Because interestingly, we didn't get digital still cameras until quite a bit later. Most of the cameras that were connected to computers were essentially outputting video. And so you'd get many frames per second out of one of these. And what you had to do in the computer was capture it with a frame capture card, frame grabber as they were known. And so you needed a large amount of memory that could hold a single frame. <laughs> That's what we considered a large amount of memory in those days. A single frame of video and it had to be fast and you would have the electronics that would basically recognize one frame of video, capture it into memory, and then you could read out of that memory into the computer um, the, the pixels that had been captured by this frame, this, uh, by this camera. So um, we would do that. We would capture. We had a wire which went from here to our special computer. We would capture it. We had a bit of software running on there, which periodically would do this. And then we had other software which would talk to that software and say, "Give me the latest image that you've captured from from this video camera." And initially, we did that with our own networking system, um, using our own networking protocols. It wasn't TCP/IP and things like that that people may be familiar with today. Um, but later, we converted it to use more standard internet protocols, and, um, and that meant that it was easy to, to turn it into something that output HTTP, which is the hypertext transfer protocol that web browsers use. And it was remarkably easy to do that because HTTP was so simple. It was quick and easy to do because we already had a lot of expertise in the group. We had software libraries that would allow us to capture images from cameras. We had networking systems that would allow us to send images over networks to other machines and so on. So we could do it. I think it just you know, took us a rainy afternoon uh, and, we, and we threw this together. And then um, it was also very easy a little while later to connect it to the web because the web was so simple. And um, I've always thought that this kind of illustrates part of the reason the web was such a success. Because we had some data from a previous fun project and we were able to share it on the web without paying any license fees, without asking anyone's permission, without even having to learn very much. Because the web, particularly in those days, was so simple. You could read all the specifications and write your own web server you know, in an afternoon. And, um, and that, I think, was a big part of its success. It was free, it was easy, and it had this sort of global reach. So it wasn't a big investment of our time from the university's point of view. It started to get more famous because a local journalist on one of the local papers um, would contact me from time to time and just say, you know, anything new on the internet, anything new on the coffee pot? Um, and I was thinking, mm, not really. Oh, I said, I think we've just had, you know, probably our millionth viewing uh, of the image. And he said, oh, that's very interesting. And he went away and he thought about it. And he came back and he said, how long has it been going? And I said, oh, a couple of years at that point. And he worked out that that meant that at least in a virtual sense, it was more popular 
as a visitor attraction than King's College Chapel, which is the biggest tourist attraction in this part of the country. And so um, it, became, it went into the local press as, you know, East Anglia's biggest tourist attraction is this little coffee pot in the computer lab. And that then made national news and then it made international news. And that was the start of this. Um, and yes, it just, it just grew from there. I sometimes wonder if the appeal of webcams might go a bit deeper in the sense that, particularly at that point, when you were browsing the web, you went from reasonably static page to reasonably static page. You were looking at documents, you were looking at electronic bits of text, maybe some graphics, um, but you were definitely in the virtual world. And then suddenly you'd go to this page where you'd see a little bit of the real world as well in this little window, and it, admittedly it wasn't a very exciting part of the real world. Uh, it wasn't a place you would ever be really interested in, um, but somewhere in the midst of this you were actually seeing a bit of reality, and it was live reality. And th this was kind of the first time that had happened. You know, we could, we could see things at a distance before. We could, um, we could uh, you know, view television programs, uh, we could look through telescopes, you know, there were various ways you could do this. But actually, to go to a place and say, at this moment in time, I want to see what's happening now somewhere else in the world, um, this was actually you know, a fairly rare thing, and even if it was only a crazy little thing like a coffee pot. Well, there is, a, there is a great history in many innovations, both in computing and elsewhere, of um, people doing little side projects, which then turn out to be the big project. You know, the, the classic ones are things like post-it notes and so on, which turn out to earn a huge amount of money and were, you know, just treated as, uh, as small side experiments at the time. So I do think that it's often the unexpected output of research that's the most interesting.